Okay, um, so hello again. So now uh, we'll really start getting into the material of the class here. Uh, and this is basically the very first section of the textbook. Um, so sec like section, chapter one, section one, uh, which is about the natural numbers. So the natural numbers are kind of like the simplest number system you could possibly imagine. Um, it's the number system that people have that people knew about for, since you know ancient ancient times. It's like the oldest number system in existence, right? And uh, so the natural numbers are sometimes also what we refer to as like the whole numbers, the counting numbers. There's some um, inconsistencies about oh, hold on uh, about uh, you know what exactly they represent. So for our purposes, the natural numbers is the following set. And we write uh, this n, blackboard bold n, to represent the natural numbers. It's the set one, two, three. OK. And so right now, as it stands, I, I mean, just writing it that way is kind of, uh, it almost doesn't really mean anything. I mean, this is just something intuitive for you guys to get a sense of what it is. Um, the real way to characterize it would be to assert or postulate some axioms which give us a complete picture of exactly what is true about the natural numbers and what isn't, okay? So these axioms are called, sometimes called Piano's axioms. Um, so Piano's axioms are the axioms that characterize the natural number system. Uh, and the way the book numbers them is with n. So they, they do n1 is the first of Piano's axioms. So um, n1 is just saying that the number one is in n. Actually more sort of rigorous or more precisely, really what n1 is saying is simply that there exists a, an element of the natural numbers, which we call one, okay? Uh, so as it stands, actually, this symbol doesn't really, it has no properties, so it doesn't really represent the number one yet, but you'll see. So the next one is um, if something, anything, if n, little n, represents an element of the natural numbers, then really, um, so n has a successor. n plus one, which is also a natural number. So this is just defining sort of a rule or like the concept that each number, for each number in the natural numbers, there's another number which comes next. And we call that one n plus one, okay? It's all kind of very abstract, but obviously the notation is chosen intentionally so that uh, it all kind of makes sense intuitively, right? Uh, the third axiom is that one is not the successor of any element of n. So one is like the first number in this system. The fourth axiom is that if n and m are elements of n, then, or whoops, sorry. Uh, yes, and have the same successor then n equals m. So that's just saying that no two numbers can actually have the same successor. Seems kind of obvious, but we actually have to assert that as an axiom. The last one is um, if a subset of N contains one 
and always contains n plus one whenever it contains n, then the subset is all of n. Sorry, I got a little cramped here. So this is just saying, this is actually basically the axiom which lets us do mathematical arguments by mathematical induction, right? So actually, you know, well, philosophers can quibble over this, but um, without that axiom, in some sense, uh, inductive arguments would not apply. They would not actually be sound. Uh, it would not be sound to make inductive arguments about the natural numbers. So I want to just take a moment and tell you guys that um, these axioms themselves, n1 through n5 or whatever, you do not have to know these, obviously, like by heart. Uh, in fact, we probably won't really be doing anything. I'm not going to really give you any problems that actually will make you invoke these axioms directly, okay? And certainly, like, if you ever want to do an inductive proof, you do not have to, like, cite Piano's axiom number five uh, to, to make that argument, okay? But really what I'm trying to do, what, what the point of this is, is to show you, um, first of all, what it looks like to axiomatize a system, okay? There's going to be more axioms that we cover, and the, the later ones will be more important. So we're going to axiomatize the rational numbers, and then we'll also give axioms for the real numbers, okay? And those systems of axioms are actually very important. Um, and we will probably be doing a bit of stuff with, like, proving stuff directly with those axioms, okay? Um, so I'm just trying to show you what this looks like. And also, this is kind of a good, it gives a good uh, sort of jumping off point for talking about induction, because we will be doing some proofs by induction, you will probably have to do a couple, at least a couple of proofs by induction here and there. So I want to sort of warn you guys that you really, you want to make sure that you're comfortable with that idea and that you're familiar with the concept. So I'll do an example proof by induction right now, um, which I also think shows a little bit of nice stuff about kind of like analytical thinking uh, that, you know, we'll be coming back to later in the class. So let me um, clear this. But yeah, so Piano's axioms, you know, it's kind of cool to know about them, but uh, they're not directly critical for uh, anything that we have to do. So I want to give you a, um, here, let's hold on, an example. Oops. Example proof by induction. Um, so we're going to prove, let's see, what is it? Sine of nx is less than or equal to n sine of x for all real x. You don't have to worry about that. And for all natural numbers n. Oops. Okay. So um, the first thing to do in a proof by induction, right, is to handle the base case. And the base case is when n equals one, at least in this case. So, I mean, obviously you can make proofs by induction with a different base case and that's just like sort of, it's the same basic concept, but just slightly modified. Oops. So um, in this case, the base case is n equals one. And when n equals one, the equation is just literally, it's just obviously true because, or the inequality, sorry, is just true because uh, you have sine x on both sides. So yeah, obviously absolute value of sine of x is less than or equal to itself. So the base case is uh, sort of obvious, I'll say. Sorry, the handwriting is a little bit shabby there. Um, so now the next thing is the inductive step. So inductive step. Suppose 
uh, the inequality holds for some value of n. So some particular value of n, which we don't know what it is, but we're just going to suppose that it's true for some value of n, uh, then and now I'm going to kind of write out a string of inequalities. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to analyze sine of n plus 1 x. What's our goal here? Right? Actually, maybe you want to pause the video and just like think to yourself, what are we actually trying? What's the statement we ultimately want to show here? Right? So I don't know if you did that, but uh, what we really want to do to finish the inductive step is get to the point where we have shown that sine of n plus 1 x is less than or equal to n plus 1 times sine of x. Like, so you replace all the n's up here with n plus 1. We want to be able to show that. Okay, So we want to analyze sine of n plus 1 x. Well, the first thing we might want to do is try to relate it to sine of n x. Right? Uh, so we might want to use the sum of angles formula. So oops, uh, let, me, let me do that. So let's say this is equal to, it's a little bit long. so sine of nx cosine of x plus cosine of nx sine of x, right? Okay. Now, so how can we progress from here? Well, you know, we haven't really talked about this yet, but so this is kind of a preview of some stuff that you might want to get used to and a preview of some concepts we'll come back to, but um, now we can use the triangle inequality to sort of break up this um, absolute value of a sum. So this is less than or equal to sine of nx. And even without the triangle inequality, you can always take products of two things inside an absolute value and you can just separate those, right? So this is cosine of x plus, and then we have absolute value of cosine of nx, absolute value of sine of x. Okay, so that's good. Uh, and now we can say that this is less than or equal to absolute value of sine of nx, oops, plus absolute value of sine of x. Uh, and the reason this is true is just because this is, right here, let me change color for a second. Uh, so this is less than or equal to one. And this absolute value is also less than or equal to one. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oops, that's not what I wanted to say. Um, this absolute value <laughs> is also less than or equal to one, right? So, but term by term, this um, this term was less than or equal to this one, and this term was less than or equal to this one, right? Okay, good. So, let's continue. So now we're going to say that this was less than or equal to n sine of x uh, plus sine of x. And then this equals n plus 1 absolute value of sine of x, right? Uh, and so that completes the uh, inductive argument. So, right, we showed that this was less than or equal to this, and that's what we wanted to do. Now, one important question, okay, is where did we use the inductive hypothesis? Okay, the inductive hypothesis was this. Suppose that holds for some value of n. This is called the inductive hypothesis. Where did we use that? If you want to think about it for a second, um, you can pause. So we use the inductive hypothesis in going from this step to this one. This is by the inductive hypothesis, right? Because in making this step, we, um, we're saying that absolute value of sine of nx is less than or equal to n absolute value of sine of x. That's what we assumed up here as the inductive hypothesis, okay? So we use the inductive hypothesis to show that the same statement is true when you increment n by one. And that's an argument by induction. Okay, so you should hopefully be familiar with that to some extent. And uh, yeah, uh, that's it for this video. See you guys in the next one.